After the smoke of the Second World War had cleared in the Philippines, the elite that was constituted during the American period re-emerged unscathed. When the Americans decided to end its occupation in 1946, the entirety of national politics was left at the hands of these Filipino politicians who jostled for power and influence in the newly independent republic. The monopolistic hold of the Partido Nacionalista was challenged by the Partido Liberal. But despite the supposed Philippine autonomy, the United States of America maintained a strong influence on our national politics on various fronts. The Philippine economy remained profoundly tied to that of the U.S., and policies and security was determined by our continuous allegiance with the same. Such was done through various means, including programs on military assistance, aids, and at times, covert operations to manipulate elections. In the latest episode of Primary Sources and You, we are going to zoom in to one of the most popular figure in the Philippine post-war politics, Ramon Magsaysay, through a Philippine Free Press article penned by Leon T. entitled, It is up to you now. Let us talk about the career of one of the most popular Philippine presidents of the 20th century and try to answer the question, whose guy really is Ramon Magsaysay? This is Podcast, conversations on Philippine history, politics, and society. Hello sa inyong lahat, ako si Lee, at ito nga whose guy is Magsaysay ay halaw dun sa isa sa mga slogan niya. Nung tumakbo siyang presidente, di ba? Yung magsaysay is my guy. Oo, no. Isa sa mga often overlooked detail tungkol kay magsaysay. Or sabi nga ng mga Amerikano, ayaw kasi gawin nila yung impression. Magsaysay is my guy. <laughs> <laughs> bilang isang political figure. Kil- kilala siya bilang people's president. No? Hello, ako si Aaron. And I'm Vec. Tama. Kaya tingin ko, very fitting talaga na si Magsaysay ang talakayan natin pagdating dun sa period na tatawagin ng mga national historian as the neo-colonial period. So pag sinabing neo-colonial, ibig sabihin parang nawala na yung formal na control ng mga Amerikano sa mga prusiyan ng bansa. Pero tulad yung nabanggit kanina, their influence remained profound. Not just in the economy, but also in politics, culture, and society in general. So natapos yung Second World War noong 1945, eksaktong sampung taon mula sa pagkakatatag ng 10-year transitory Commonwealth period. So sakto, ayon sa tidings McDuffie Law, palalayaan na tayo ng United States after 10 years. Yeah, pero uh, na-cut short yung Commonwealth government na yan, yung parang final exam nga natin. Kasi noong 1941, sumiklab yung Second World War dito sa Pilipinas at tinatag yung Second Republic dito. So arguably, meron pang natitirang apat na taon ang Estados Unidos. Pero suddenly, they became very generous. Diba? Biglang, okay, time's up. Uh, malaya na kayo. Congrats. No? Tapos, na, bye-bye. Ganyan, no? Yan, so take note ah. After the war... Manila was the second most devastated city in the world, kasunod lang ng Warsaw sa Poland. So yung pagkadurog ng Warsaw, maunawaan mo yan, di ba? Kasi yun talaga yung, yung sentro ng digmaan. Pero Manila was just this random city in a random archipelago in the Pacific. And who's responsible for the destruction of Manila ng World War II? Uh, hindi mga Hapon. In fact, the United States of America. Sabi nga nila, the Japanese killed the Filipinos with their guns and bayonets, but it was the United States and their bombs that really crushed Manila and raised it to the ground. So, in that context, it was really convenient for the Americans to suddenly, you know, in a way, grant us independence. Parang, they dropped us like a hot potato, eh, di ba? Ito na naman yung parang, I shall return ni ni MacArthur na na umalis kaya may may return. Diba? Parang bala na kayo, babae tapos na yung war, no? So so Filipino political leaders like for example Manuel Rojas had to scramble for money, no? For reparations after the war. No? So si Manuel Rojas yung naging uh, president no noong 1946, no? So and the US actually offered us some but for a hefty price, like free trade agreements, access to our natural resources, and so on. And to add insult to injury, itong mga reparation funds na to were funneled uh, to projects that did not really benefit the masses. And in a lot of instances, na uwi din, syempre, 
sa corruption. Grabe, no? Tragic talaga. Pero uh, mahalagang pag-usapan to, itong mga ganitong pangyayari in the immediate post-war period. Kasi I think, this has been a very decisive factor in the way that our post-war politics was actually shaped. Pero bukod pa dyan, the post-war period also gave birth to another global phenomenon that provided further context sa politika ng bansa noong mid-20th century. At ito yung tinatawag natin na Cold War. So, isang mabilis lang, no? So, yung Cold War, nangyari siya um, kasi merong dalawang superpower na nag-emerge after nung digmaan. So, namely, the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or USSR. So, after the war, uh, sila na yung dalawang kapangyarihan na nagko-contend para sa world supremacy. Uh, at yung basis talaga ng contention na to, I think, arguably, ay talagang ideolo- ideological, no? whereas the United States um, uh, was the leader of the liberal democratic world and the USSR was the leader of the socialist communist um, world order. So, uh, kumbaga, nagkaroon ng race for for um, territories and at the same time for I mean, arms race din, nagkaroon ng arms race. Diba? Ang, ang tawag ng mga international relations scholar dyan ay mutually assured destruction kung saan yung parehong bansa ay nag-accumulate ng maraming mga uh, armas. And hindi lang basta-basta armas, ano, nuclear uh, nuclear weapons uh, during this time. So ito yung konteksto kung saan nag expand yung Amerika sa, sa, sa Pacific, sa Timog Silang Asia. At nag expand din ang, ang Russia sa iba't ibang bagay ng daigdig kabilang ang Middle East at dito rin sa sa timog silang Asia. Siyempre needless to say that the Philippines had to take the side of the United States. Very crucial din ang Pilipinas sa Cold War kasi lumalakas ang communist China at naiimpluwensyahan ng communist ideology ang mga karatig bansa like Korea, Vietnam and other parts of Indochina. Yes indeed. So within this global context of a Cold War, Uh, in the Philippines, no, dahil nga we had to make a choice at uh, tayo ay in a way parang walang choice na napunta doon sa side ng United States. It meant no na there would be um, there would be more aggressive campaigns against Filipino communists kasi syempre uh, the United States at yung mga kakampanya were preventing yung domino effect na na mangyayari na magto-turn quote unquote red yung mga mga bansa. So, alam mo itatatag yung Joint US Military Assistance Group or yung JUSMAG. At magkakaroon din, as a matter of historical record, syempre, no, ng stronger presence ang Central Intelligence Agency o yung CIA sa bansa. Interestingly, the post-war period also saw the relentless growth of communist forces in the countryside. No? So, habang umiigting ang kahirapan sa kanayunan, nagkaroon ng dahilan ang maraming mga Pilipinong Mag, magbubukid na sumapi dito sa mga rebelde. No, maraming uh, pinasinaya ang programs, ang JUSMAG at ang Philippine Armed Forces to counter no the, the growing communist insurgency. Kasi syempre praning yung mga Amerikano kasi Cold War eh. They could not lose the Philippines to the communists kasi napaka-strategic nung, nung location natin sa Southeast Asia. No, so they recognize that they did not need a strong armed forces to actually annihilate the the hooks no mga time na yon they also needed a popular pro-american government and they're in luck kasi the president during that time Elpidio Quirino was actually pro-american ang problema nga lang hindi siya popular he was involved in many corruption cases di ba nga meron pang sumikat na rumor noon na meron siyang golden arinola mm. so matindi yung corruption issues din na, na ibinato sa kanya. And the Americans knew that, you know, there was a good chance that if Quirino runs for re-election during a time na pwede pang mag elect ang mga presidente ng Pilipinas, uh, he would not win the next election. Ano yung ibig sabihin? Ang mananalo, yung mga old guard, yung nationalista. Pwedeng si Jose P. Laurel or si Claro M. Recto. In the context of the Cold War, the United States could not lose their hold to the Philippine presidency. At dito papasok si Ramon Magsaysay. Ayan, so si Magsaysay ay isa na talagang politiko ng mga panahon na to. Isa siya sa mga nakinabang dun sa post-war politics kung saan he was able to acquire a considerable bailiwick in Zambales. Uh, lumaban kasi yan nung World War II against the Japanese. Uh, lumaban siya with the USAFE. So eventually he became governor of Zambales and 
Colonel Edward Lansdale of the Juice Mag and well of the CIA strongly recommended Magsaysay to become the Defense Secretary of President Carino and boy he shined as Defense Secretary for example he was able to really tremendously weaken the Hook Rebellion so talagang golden boy itong si Ramon Magsaysay and he also developed a really strong friendship with Lansdale and historians would say that Lansdale had a hand in the image that Magsaysay built around himself So, Magsaysay was a liberal, there was a liberal president who was up for the election, so obviously the party, liberal party, wouldn't have him as a standard bearer, no? Kasi nga, up for the election yung incumbent eh. So, they would go with the incumbent. So, uh, basic naman yun, ano? So, ito, ang mangyayari ay isa sa mga pinakamaaga and I guess pinaka-importanting instance ng party switching sa ating post-war history. Uh, Magsaysay had to leave Partido Liberal. But how was this played into the public? So, knowing this context, um, interesting talagang mabasa itong kwento sa article ni Leonti. So, uh, this is how the story goes. Can I have a talk with you someplace tonight? He said with a note of anxiety in his voice. Sure, replied the newsman. Where shall we meet? Suppose we take supper together. Okay. Magsaysay mentioned the name of the restaurant where he and the reporter were to meet. After about an hour, the then Secretary of National Defense and the newsman were seated together at the table. I called you up because I have a problem. Magsaysay began the intimate conversation. What problem? I guess you know about it already. He said. It's the way the Apo, referring to President Carino, is doing things these days. It's that sea sugar which he wants to ship to Japan at any cost, regardless of what the law and public opinion say. You know who owns that sugar. Yes, I know. The president's compadre. The newspaper man cut in. That's what makes it scandalous. I'm against it, and because the Apo knows my stand on the sea sugar issue, he has become indifferent to me. I don't think I still enjoy his confidence. The newspaper man told Magsaysay that there was nothing he could do. Could he possibly defy the man who had made him a member of his official family? Take it easy, Monching. The reporter suggested. After a week or so, the Apple will have forgotten the matter, and you two will be again best of friends, as you have always been. I have my doubts. Magsaysay answered rather gloomily. The Apple seems to dislike me now. But why should he dislike you? The newsman queried. Didn't you restore peace and order for him? You gave him prestige when you kept the 1951 elections clean. The president has repeatedly said he's proud of you. Magsaysay said Carino began to be indifferent to him when articles about his success in combating the hooks were published in leading American magazines like Time, Life, Saturday Evening Post, Newsweek, and Collier's. What do you plan to do now? Magsaysay was asked toward the end of the conversation. Resign from the cabinet and join a third party. I can't join the opposition. I don't think the nationalista would accept me, knowing I'm a liberal. But what will you do in a third party? Inquired the newsman. I'll run for senator. Ayan, no? So, sobrang familiar ng trope, diba? Pinapakita that Magsaysay did not initially intend to run for president. He was only aiming for senator. Pero ang mahalagang ang tingnan dyan, yung party switching. So he was hesitant to transfer to nationalista kasi sabi niya, di ako tatanggapin dyan. Alam nilang liberal ako. Pero mahalagang inote, no? Uh, na wala naman talagang masyadong crucial difference sa programa ng dalawang partidong yan. Patricia Abinales and Donna Amoroso, for example, would in fact call what we had then as parang coke Pepsi politics, di ba? Parang wala namang mag... Di naman, pareho lang naman yung lasa, pero parang magkalaban. Pero nakakatawa nung sinabi na magsaysay na I'm a liberal. Naakala mo it means something in terms of distinct principles and politics, no? At nabanggit din ni Aaron kanina, sobrang familiar yung trope nung underdog, nung hesitant candidate who eventually rose to the challenge of the presidency. Nasa simula, reluctant ka muna, papilit ka muna, until the people will call on you to run. Parang run, munching run. Pamilyar eh, no? Paano nga ba pinakage yung si Magsaysay when he was to run for president? After all, he was not of the same mold as the earlier presidents na mga abogado, mga statesmen, nagaling sa landed elite. He was painted as something that is authentic. 
He was a college dropout. He was a former bus company employee. He wears barong Tagalog. He speaks Carabao English. And he laughs at his own jokes. Ganyan. So, very populist, kumbaga. Kaya yung populism, hindi yan bago talaga eh. So, with this branding, no match talaga si Quirino. Na matanda, elite, tapos rumored pa na very corrupt. Tapos, siyempre, idagdag pa yung talagang media mileage na ibinigay kay Magsaysay. Yung nabanggit kanina dun sa uh, article na na-feature siya sa Times, sa Newsweek, at sa iba pa. At may mga kwento pa dyan at kumakalat about how Magsaysay, for example, admonished errant and corrupt soldiers as the uh, defense secretary. Uh, tapos, meron din kwento na ano daw, parang uh, how he promoted wounded soldiers sa mga ospital mismo on the spot. O, oh, ba diba? Talagang ano, tapang at malasakit. So, poster historians would say that all of these were actually orchestrated by Colonel Lansdale. Kaya eventually, uh, itong si Lansdale would gain the moniker of Colonel Landslide. ba? Diba? Kasi grabe talaga yung naging panalo ni Magsaysay against Quirino. At talagang epic itong candidacy ni Magsaysay. Parang siya nga daw yung, ano eh, yung isa sa mga una or naunang gumamit ng, ng campaign jingle. Yung patok na patok na Mambo Magsaysay. Pakinggan natin itong legendary jingle ni Magsaysay. Sabi ng jingle, our democracy will die kung wala si Magsaysay. So, mabigat na pronouncement yan. Pero, noong mga panahon na ito, sikat na sikat daw ang mambo. And mambo is a style of music. So, they really capitalized on that. At ito nga, it was an earworm for many Filipinos that time. Pero yun nga, how did Magsaysay end up running for president? Pakinggan natin mula sa ating primary source excerpt. Magsaysay's case is unique in the political history of this country. At no other time was a member of one party invited to join another and be that group's leading candidate in a presidential election. When rumors began to circulate sometime last year that the leading political figures in the opposition were seriously considering the idea of inviting Magsaysay to join them and later drafting him for the presidency to fight Quirino, some people exclaimed, That's fantastic. Why would the Nationalistas get a liberal to be their presidential candidate? No, it can't happen. It has never been done before. The opposition is not in dire need of presidential material. It has Laurel, Recto, Osias, and Rodriguez. Why would the Nationalistas pick a liberal of all people? But it did happen. After a series of negotiations on the initiative of Senator Tanyada, Mon Ching was finally persuaded to quit his cabinet position, resign from the Liberal Party, and join the Nationalistas. So ayan na nga, magsaysay, finally transferred ships. Parang mapapaisip ka din talaga, ano, bakit pumayag yung mga nationalista to take magsaysay in and to have him as the standard bearer at that? Eh supposedly, anti-American tong mga to at hindi naman secret talaga yung closeness ni magsaysay sa mga Amerikano at this point in his career. So a lot of things can be surmised. Bakit nagkaganoan? Pwedeng dahil din sa aging leadership ng nasyonalista o pwedeng alam nila na at this point talagang wala silang masyadong political capital at machinery to win a presidential election. And they wanted so badly to be back at the helm. Pero Leontis article would put nasyonalista's decision this way. Many people are still wondering why Dr. Laurel was willing to sacrifice his personal ambition in favor of the former LP Defense Secretary. They still believe that in a clean election, Laurel would win against any liberal as shown in 1951. With victory practically in sight, 
Why did Dr. Laurel decide to invite Magsaysay to be the NP standard bearer? Senator Laurel had his reasons for this action. If I run and lose through frauds and violence, as in 1949, he is said to have told close friends, I will surely be driven to desperation. I may even have to resort to drastic measures, in which case I might have to go to the mountains and lead a band of rebels, guerrillas, that I cannot do now on account of my age. I'm tired. And if I win, could I get as much aid from the United States as Magsaysay could? I don't think so. I know pretty well how I stand in the eyes of the American people. Because of my collaboration record during the occupation, many Americans who still don't know what actually happened here during the war will stand in the way of material aid to our country. I have no choice. The welfare of our people is more important to me than my personal ambition. But if Magsaysay wins, I think America will go out of her way to help us because he is a friend. A great friend. To the American people, and for that matter, to the people of the world, Magsaysay is the physical embodiment of democracy's courageous stand against communism in the Far East. Dagdag credibility kay Magsaysay ang ganyan, di ba? Even your political opponents believed in you. So sabi nga nila, there is no statement of support that is stronger than that given by your enemies. Diba? Pag kinilala ka na ng kalaban mo, yun na yun. Diba? Pero aside from this, this demonstrates yung tinatawag nga na Coke-Pepsi politics. Diba? Walang crucial na difference yung nationalista at liberal ideologically speaking. So much so that they can have a liberal president run as nationalista. So ibig sabihin talaga, no? they just want to win. They just want to defeat. The liberals. The nationalistas were willing to be led by a liberal para lang manalo sa eleksyon. So nagsucceed si Magsaysay overwhelmingly. Um, at least na-predict ni Laurel what's going to happen. Uh, thanks to these kinds of branding and packaging and as president, isa siya sa mga nagbank talaga sa strength ng executive branch. He expanded the executive bureaucracy and made itself felt in the local level. And he was among the first to try to plan the national economy. His popularity would be immortalized because he died in a tragic plane crash. Very untimely yung kanyang death. So kumbaga, he did not live long enough to become the villain. His vice president, the nationalista Carlos P. Garcia, took over. Tapos by the following election, Garcia would lose to the liberal this dado makapagal. So ito yung itsura talaga ng national politics ng mga panahon na to. Nagpapalitan lang yung mga elite politicians from these two dominant parties sa poder. Mapanasyonalista o liberal, ang nangyari, wala namang uh, mahalagang pagbabago sa buhay ng majority ng population. So it was a political stalemate of some sort. And you know, this kind of political climate would prove to be a very convenient environment. Uh, to facilitate the rise of a political leader who might be perceived as someone espousing a different kind of politics, that which departed from this uh, template of liberal elite democracy. At yan nga si Ferdinand Marcos. At yan mismo ang pag-uusapan natin sa susunod na episode. So abangan nyo sa susunod na Sabado, pag-uusapan natin, naku, controversial, si Ferdinand Marcos at ang kanyang batas militar. And as usual, don't forget to follow us on our social media pages. Tapos i-share nyo na rin itong mga episodes natin para mas malayo ang marating ng ating mga kwentuhan. You may also visit our website if you want to know more about podcasts. That's podcast.org. Yan. So maraming maraming salamat sa pakinig. Thank you for joining us today and have a good day.